Hello, everybody. Thanks for tuning in. I'm David Arvidsson Schuker, and I'm going to talk to you about conditions tighter than non commutation needed for non classicality. Uh, and this is joint work that I've done with Jacob Chevalier Drory at the University of Cambridge and Nicole Younger Halpern at ITAMP and Harvard University. And so let's get started with a brief review of, of what I'm gonna talk about in, in, in this presentation. So first I'm gonna tell you a little bit about what quasi-probability distributions are. I'm gonna give you a quick review. And after that, I'm gonna tell you about um, a fairly unknown quasi-probability distribution that's called the Kirkwood-Dirac distribution. I'm gonna tell you about when it can be useful and why people are thinking about this thing. And then after we've talked about what the Kirkwood-Dirac distribution are, uh, we're gonna talk about when this Kirkwood-Dirac distribution takes non-classical values. And finally, we're gonna make a small note on how non-classical these distributions can be. So what we want to find out essentially is when is the Kirkwood-Dirac distribution non-classical and how non-classical can it be? So let's get started with just a brief overview of what quasi-probability distributions are. Um, Quasi-probability distributions are essentially generalizations of standard probability distributions. You get them by taking a standard probability distribution and loosening some of the mathematical conditions. For example, we know that classical probability distributions cannot describe all of quantum phenomena. But you can describe quantum phenomena if you change some of the kind of conditions on classical probability distributions. So if you allow these quasi probabilities to take negative or, or even complex values, it's possible to reproduce quantum mechanics with these things. So why, why should one bother thinking about these things? Uh, and I have two reasons for, for that. The first one is that Paul Dirac says that we, we should bother. He has this nice quote where, where he said, negative energies and probabilities should not be considered as nonsense. They are well-defined concepts mathematically, like a negative of money. Uh, and then the, the second reason is, of course, because they're useful. And I'm going to try to kind of show you why they're useful in the next couple of slides. Um, just an example of a very famous uh, quasi-probability distribution, that's the Wigner function. Um, which I, I'm sure that many of you will have heard about. Um, so, okay, if we, if we just take a step back and think about things classically, um, then say that we have some kind of phase space with momentum and position, and then we're given a point particle. So then in classical mechanics, we can um, exactly describe this point particle uh, by a point in phase space. And even if there is some uncertainty as to the value of a position or, or, or momentum of this particle, we can still describe it with a probability distribution or a joint probability distribution over these observables values. Um, but, you know, in quantum mechanics, uh, famously position and momentum don't commute. So you can't describe, you know, uncertainty about these things with a joint probability distribution in quantum mechanics. Uh, but, but you can then use something called the Wigner function, which is a quasi-probability distribution. Uh, I've stolen this picture here from Wikipedia. And as you can see, uh, this thing here, it looks very similar to a continuous joint probability distribution. If you integrate over it, you certainly get unity. Um, but at some points, it dips to negative values, which, of course, a joint probability distribution should never do. Um, but by doing this, this Wigner function can be used to express, uh, you know, quantum systems with uncertainty in terms of momentum and position. Uh, and the Wigner function is a great tool when you have a continuous infinite dimensional variables like position and momentum, or the real and imaginary component of an electromagnetic field, uh, then the Wigner function is great. That's why people have been using it to, to, do, to simplify calculations in quantum optics for, you know, many decades. Um, but, you know, modern quantum information processing is mostly framed in terms of the language of discrete quantum systems, or namely qubits. So 
in this talk, we're going to focus about, uh, on discrete systems. And then the question is, how, how do we find a suitable quasi-probability distribution to simplify calculations um, for these systems? Uh, and this was answered, you know, just a year or, 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 or maybe not even a year, just like a couple of months after Wigner came up with his uh, Wigner function in the 1930s. John Kirkwood at MIT, and then uh, a couple of years later, Paul Dirac uh, at Cambridge came up with um, an, not really an extension, but an alternative quasi-probability distribution that treated discrete observables in a different way to what the Wigner function was doing. So these guys were considering, in the simplest scenario, just two observables, so A and F. And they, they consider these observables to be discrete and, and, non, uh, and without an infinite number of eigenvalues. Um, and then they were after a quasi-probability distribution, which would allow us to express a quantum state with respect to these two observables. So this is what they were after. And they wanted this mathematical object, this quasi-probability distribution, to obey most of the kind of axioms for joint probability distributions. For example, they wanted the sum of all the entries to give us unity. And also, and this is quite important, they wanted the quasi-probability distribution to be able to reproduce experiments. So A and F are both Hermitian, so you can measure the expectation value of A and F, and you can measure the probability of, of having outcome small a or outcome small f. So if you marginalized over one of the uh, observable values, you, you want to get the classical probability distribution over the remaining one. Um, and so like, what, what can you write down in order to get a quasi-probability distribution that satisfies this? Well, they really wrote down the most simple thing they could imagine. They just you know, took the rank one projectors onto the individual uh, outcomes of, of these two observables. And then, you know, they acted on them on, on the quantum state row and took a trace. So this is kind of what you would do classically um, to get the joint probability distribution, you know, if, if these rank one projectors were compatible. Um, this is similar to a joint probability distribution, but it's not quite one because this thing here is not necessarily between zero and one. It can take negative values and it can even go uh, non-real. Um, but this is, this is the definition of the kirkwood dirac distribution or the KD distribution as, as people now, nowadays call it. Um, and and we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna talk about this object throughout this talk. So this is really the kind of thing to, to, to bear in mind. Um, I have a quick side note here, which is something that my colleague Jacob Chevalier Drory uh, at the maths department in Cambridge has been thinking a lot about. So there are other ways or other quasi probability distributions that you could define that also satisfy these conditions that we put up here. Um, but they're much less elegant. And the one thing that we're looking for is what extra condition would you have to kind of add to these in order to uniquely determine the quasi probability distribution to take this exact form? And this is, uh, this is important for reasons that have to do with like studies of foundations of quantum mechanics. So it's an open question. If anyone has any idea of a reasonable condition to add, please email me because we're very interested in knowing. Okay, but let's get going and start using this KD distribution. Um, so in this previous slide, we focused on just two observables, and this is indeed the kind of most trivial example, but in many real life experiments, there are more than two observables that are of interest. And the great thing with the character Dirac distribution is that it facilitates uh, analyses of, of problems with more um, observables as well. So here we had the the two observable KD distribution, if we instead have four, then you can write down a KD distribution like this. Or if you have K uh, observables, it will look like this. And, and, and these 
all of these distributions will satisfy this requirement that if you marginalize away over all observables except for one, you end up with a classical probability distribution. And if you sum over all the entries, you get unity. And the results, I'm gonna like give you a little spoiler here. The result of our paper, this archive paper here that, that's just in print, I believe, with, with Journal of Physics A, um, the results of this paper is that we show when this or these KD distributions take negative values. So it was previously believed by many people that if the observables do not commute, the KD distribution take negative values or complex values. And we in fact show that there are tighter conditions that you have to, um, uh, there are tighter con conditions that are sufficient for for, for non-classicality uh, rather than just non-commutation. And we pinpoint what these conditions are. And then we also show how much non-classicality a KD distribution can have. So we've seen up here that the sum of all the KD distributions elements is unity. So if this is a classical distribution, then all of these things here are zero or between zero and one. So the sum here, in the classical case, that would give us a one, and then we have a minus one here. So in the classical case, when all the entries are, 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 are real probabilities, this gives us zero. But then if you have negative values here or, or, or non-real values here, then this thing here is gonna be bigger than zero. And we bound it with respect to the discrete Hilbert space dimension. K is the number of observables we consider, and this is the maximum value this thing can take. And this is kind of important. I'm not gonna talk at length about it, but it's kind of important for people looking at different aspects of foundations of physics or fundamental quantum mechanics. So how much uh, non-classicality can a uh, quasi-probability distribution have? In particular, it's important when people are thinking about quantum scrambling and, and stuff like this. Um, let me just give you a brief example of what you can do with the KD distribution. You can do many things, but I just want to give you a very, very simple example of, of when it could be useful. So we're gonna think about studying weak values with the KD distribution. And if you don't know what the weak value is, don't worry because I'm just about to tell you what it is. A weak value is given by this formula here. This is a weak value. You can think of it as a particle that's initialized in a state psi and then later measured in a state f. And the question is, what is the expectation value of a? So a is some observable here. So you can think of it, what's the conditional expectation value of the observable a with respect to an input state psi and a final measurement f. And usually you kind of measure it with some kind of pointer particle that comes in and interacts with it. And then you can pre-select on Psi and post-select on F. And then via measurements on this pointer particle, you can find out what this conditional expectation value is or the weak value. And people have been discussing these weak values in quite some depth already, I think since the 1980s, because they can show some quite anomalous effects. So, one thing that people are interested in is when are these weak values um, classical? So are there any bounds on how big these weak values can get in a classical theory? So a theory where you, know, you can describe it with classical probabilities. So we're gonna do some very, very simple algebra on this expression. And then we're gonna see if we can use the kirchhoff dirac distribution to, uh, to find such classical bounds on, on this value. So first, we're gonna take uh, the decomposition of the observable A and, and wedge it in into this expression. And then we end up with this formula here. And now we're gonna take uh, the dot product of Psi with F and multiply in the denominator and the numerator. Uh, and then we get this formula here. So I've just multiplied by this factor here, both up and down. So we go from here to here. And now we can see that the numerator, that's a Kirchhoff-Dirac quasi-probability, right? Um, 
And then the numerator, the numerator is the probability of, final, of measuring the final particle in state f when it was initialized in psi. So what we have here in the fraction, that's really a conditioned or Bayesian updated quasi-probability distribution. So it's the kirchhoff dirac distribution with respect to f and a, um, with respect to f and a, a condition on the final outcome f. So we know in classical probability theory, if you have a joint probability distribution and you do a Bayesian update on it, you, you end up with a new joint probability distribution. So in a classical theory, this fraction here is going to give you a probability distribution between with values between zero and one. So now you can take this expression here and then you can minimize and maximize it with respect to this distribution. And if we assume that this distribution is classical, so no values are non-real or negative, you will find that the minimum value of the weak value is equal to the minimum eigenvalue of the observable A. And the maximum value of the weak value is equal to the maximum eigenvalue of the observable A. And this is true if the KD distribution is classical. Um, so that's, that's a very nice thing. We could now find the classical bound on this. So in like theories that you can describe with classical KD distributions, the weak value should never be smaller than A min or larger than A max. And we know from quantum experiments that there are many, many cases where the weak value actually is below um, A min or above A max. Um, so this is just a simple way of showing that such uh, experiments, then you have some kind of um, non-classical physics going on. And in the, in the specific example of, of weak values, that kind of non-classicality you have going on is, is, is kind of deeply rooted with, with fundamental quantum non-classicality, namely contextuality. Okay, so just to summarize what we've learned about the KD distribution so far, um, we can, we can take a physical formula. So I call this physical for formula big F here. And then we can, as we did on the slide before, we can decompose the physical formula in terms of a KD distribution. And then you can find a classical bound by um, maximizing. So we will find the what's the classical maximum of this formula. You find that by, you know, maximizing the formula with respect to classical kirchhoff dirac distribution. And then you can find a quantum bound by maximizing the formula with respect to a general kirchhoff dirac distribution that can take negative or, or non-real values. And then in some scenarios, you will find that the quantum optimization can give you bigger values than the classical optimization. And then you kind of localized an area where you could get quantum advantages. Um, from this negative and non-real aspects of, of your kirchhoff dirac distribution. Okay, so this is really the motivation about why people are interested in the kirchhoff dirac distribution. It's because it's a very, very neat way of applying techniques from, from classical statistics and probability theory to optimize formally with respect to probability distributions. And you can use these techniques in order to find classical and quantum bounds. And it's proven immensely useful. So I'm just, I'm not gonna talk about these in details, but it's been used to study uh, quantum scrambling or out of time ordered correlators in a bunch of recent papers. It, it's been used to study quantum thermodynamics, for example, quantum heat engines, and uh, uh, it's been used in quantum metrology and also in the study of foundations of quantum mechanics. And just a little side note, if there are any foundations people out there, so if you remember the consistence, consistent histories interpretation of quantum mechanics, the weights of the different histories in that interpretation actually equal KD um, quasi-probabilities. Um, okay, uh, so this is really the motivation. Um, when it comes to the Wigner function that I said has been an immensely useful tool when it comes to studying continuous variable infinite dimensional systems, already in 1973, Hudson showed when this Wigner function took non-classical values. But 
When it comes to the Kirkwood direct distribution, people didn't really know. It was kind of assumed uh, a bunch of things about when it would go negative or, 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 or non-real, but, but it's not until our, our recent paper that, that we've really pinned down what's going on with it. Um, okay. So just a quick reminder, if we're given a quantum state and we're gonna keep things pure for now in, in our paper that I, I'll put the reference on in the last slide. In our paper, we look at mixed states and de degenerate observables. But for now, let's just think about pure states and non-degenerate observables A and F. So if we have a pure state, psi A and F, then the kirchhoff dirac distribution is given by, by this formula here. So, so when, is the, the, the distribution non-classical. So a first guess, which is a surprisingly common guess, is that when A and F, so the two observables, when they don't commute, there has to be at least one non-real or negative entry in the kirchhoff dirac distribution. Um, but this is just plainly wrong. And it's very easy to see that it's wrong if you, if you say that psi is equal to one of the eigenvectors of, of A or F, it's, it's very clear that this thing is gonna be, is gonna be a classical probability for, for all values of A and F. Um, so that doesn't work. A second guess would be that when A and F don't commute, rho and F don't commute and rho and A don't commute. So there's no pairwise commutation between these, this row and the two observables, then many people said, well, then surely the kirchhoff dirac distribution should be negative or at least have some non-real entries. Uh, and after a bit of fiddling, um, one can come up with counterexamples. So for example, if we, if we take rho to be given by this matrix or represented by this matrix and a represented by this matrix and, and F represented by this matrix, then, you know, A and F, Rho and F and Rho and A, neither of them commute, but still you would get the classical kirchhoff dirac distribution. And, and if you write it out in this matrix formalism, it's quite easy to see because A and F do not commute on a different part of the Hilbert space to where rho has kind of quantum state support, so to speak. So even in these scenarios, you can get Kirkwood Dirac dis distributions that are fully classical. Now, so, so how do we answer this question? When, when, when do you really get, or what, what are really the sufficient requirements for, for KD non-classicality? So again, here's the Kirkwood Dirac distribution. Um, in order to find out what sufficient requirements for non-classicality were, we started kind of at the other end of the problem. So we started by looking for necessary conditions for Kirkwood Dirac classicality. Uh, we wrote down the Kirkwood Dirac distribution like this, and then we did a phase rescaling uh, with respect to our observables A and F. So we rescale the eigenvectors A and F so that this thing here, the right-hand side of this, this part of the equation, so that this thing is real and, um, and, uh, and non-negative. Because if you do that rescaling, you en encapsulate all the kind of, all the kind of non-classical values in the dot product of F with A. So, so that's the first thing we did. And I'm really just gonna sketch the proof. I'm not gonna go into the gory mathematical details that are outlined in our, in our way too, too long appendix of our, of our up and coming paper. Um, but, but the useful trick here is that if we rescale it such that this thing here is, is, is real and non-negative, then as I said, this thing here will be real and non-negative if f dot a is real and non-negative, unless this thing here is zero. So if a dotted with psi or psi dotted with f is equal to zero, 
then this left factor here can take a negative or imaginary values and, and you still would have a classical KD quasi probability because you know if this is zero doesn't matter what this is this will also be zero so essentially what we have to consider is like we only need to care about the a vectors and the f vectors which are not orthogonal to psi because if they are orthogonal to psi the kd quasi probability is zero and 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 then you know zero is classical so that's fine so i just want to stress this again we only need to care about the a's and the f's which are not orthogonal to psi so we need to do just two simple definitions in order to kind of proceed with our proof. We need to define the number of A vectors in the observable A that are non-orthogonal to Psi. Um, so we call that number NA. And then we need to define the number of F vectors that are non-orthogonal to Psi. We call that number NF. Uh, and the result we find in our paper is, is a classical bound. So if your Kirkwood Dirac distribution is classical, then necessarily you need to satisfy this inequality. So two times NA plus two times NF has to be less than or equal to three times the dimensionality of your Hilbert space. So this is a necessary condition for KD non -classical, for KD classicality. And I've kind of skipped the small things. Actually, you need a, a, a small correction term um, in the case if some of the A vectors are equal to some of the F vectors. And I'll briefly mention that in a couple of slides. So how do we arrive at this? It's, it's a really, really nit gritty and, and, and untidy and kind of, kind of annoying proof. And what it amounts to is to taking kind of complex Hilbert space dimensional hypercubes and putting them into complex Hilbert space dimensional hyper corners. Uh, and just like that sounds crazy, but let's let's just see what, what, what that means. So if, here's an example. So if we have dimension three, uh, so this is the Hilbert space dimension. And then we say that three of the vectors, eigenvectors of the observable F uh, are non-orthogonal with psi and two of the um, eigenvectors of the observable A are non-orthogonal to psi. So NA is two, NF is three, and the dimensionality is three. And then just for the kind of schematic here, I'm going to pretend that we're, we're in real space instead of complex space, just to kind of be able to visualize this. So we can write down the three orthogonal F vectors as this corner here. Um, so this is the corner. And then here we have the two-dimensional kind of slab of the A vectors that we care about. So then, you know, if you take these A vectors and try to fit them into this corner, you will see that in this scenario, for example, this A vector here would have a negative overlap with this F vector. Um, similarly, uh, this A vector, the, the, this one here, would have a negative overlap with, uh, sorry, this A vector here would have a negative overlap with this F vector. So this one would like come, down, come down here, which would be in the negative of this. So this would give you some negative, um, uh, negative values in your KD distribution. And, and after a bit of fiddling around with this, it's kind of evident that the only way that you can eliminate all the negative entries here is by having A and F completely compatible so that their dot product gives you the Kronecker delta function. Um, so this is like in this specific uh, N equals two, N F equals three, D equals three example, then you know we've kind of found what are the necessary conditions for, for KD classicality. But the problem in an arbitrary dimension is, is, is kind of much trickier. So what you have to do is that you have to consider a unitary matrix of these inner products of A with F, and then you have to kind of do a bunch of, of combinatorics and, and kind of, yeah, a bunch of combinatorics essentially to kind of fill this matrix in, 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 in a way that, that 
that ensures that the entire KD distribution is, is, is classical. And, and we, we, we kind of outline the specifics of this in our paper. So please, please go and look that up if you're interested. But I'm not going to talk more about this kind of details of it in this talk. Uh, instead, I'm just going to say that what you'll find is, is precisely this inequality that I showed you a couple of slides ago. And, and then I said you had to do some corrections, and these corrections are if some of the A vectors are parallel to some of the F vectors and non-orthogonal to Psi, then you have to add this, this value here. And then similarly, if some of the A vectors are parallel to some of the, uh, the Fs, and orthogonal to Psi, then you have to subtract three times this value here. So this equation here is a necessary condition for KD classicality. So if you violate it, or if you, you know, switch the signs of uh, switch this to, to a greater than sign, then you have a sufficient condition for, for KD non-classicality. Okay. Um, I mentioned earlier that in our paper, I'm going to reiterate, in our paper, we also look at how to extend this to um, A's and F's observables that are degenerate, and we also extend it to, to mixed states. A final point before I kind of summarize this talk, I, I promised that uh, I'd also bound how much non-classicality can be, can be hidden in a kirkwood dirac distribution. Um, we saw in the previous slides that if you sum over all the entries of the KD distribution, you get unity. So this quantity here, which was suggested by Justin Dressel, has been used as a kind of measure of how much non-classicality there is in a KD distribution. Because if all of these are classical probabilities, then this thing here will give you one. So minus one plus one will be zero. Uh, so if, if you have a classical distribution, this value is zero, but if some of these things can be negative or non-real, then this value will be greater than, uh, greater than zero. In our paper, we, we derive a theorem which shows that zero lower bounds the non-classicality measure and then the Hilbert space dimensionality to the power of the number of observables minus one over two minus one, that's the maximum value. And again, this is, this is quite an important result when it comes to looking at quantum scrambling because it really kind of, it tells you how much can a quantum system be scrambled. Um, and how, did we, how did we find this? And, and when, when do you actually saturate this upper bound? Because you can actually saturate it. Um, and, and you kind of find that by rewriting this non-classicality measure. So let us expand this out in terms of its individual components. Then you end up with, you know, something that looks like this. Um, so a bunch of inner products multiplied by each other. Um, and, and the way to get to saturate this bound is when the magnitude, so the absolute value of all of these inner products uh, are equal to one over the square root of the dimensionality of the Hilbert space. So when each one of these things are equal to one of the square root of D, then, then you get this. And the way to get that is to chose, choose Psi and all the eigenvectors that make up your observables A and F and C and D to K. When you choose all the eigenvectors, and so all the vectors in this expression, when they are chosen from mutually unbiased basis, that then you will you will satisfy this bound. Uh, okay, um, so so let me just summarize brief conclusion here. Um, so we saw in the beginning of this talk that the Kirkwood Rack distribution can be a very useful thing uh, if you want to use probabilistic or statistical methods to upper or lower bound various physical formulae, and and this also kind of allows you to kind of see. Uh, when an experiment shows a true uh, quantum behavior and uh, quantum behavior in, in terms of it's not being able to be um, kind of uh, reproduced by, by classical uh, probability distribution. So, so that's why you use the kirkwood dirac distribution. And, and I've shown you these results we have in, in our papers here that um, show you that non-commutation is, is not enough to get this, this non-classicality.
uh, and to reach the or kind of breach the, the the classical bounds, you need something more stringent, something stricter than just non-commutation. You need to violate this inequality I showed on the previous slides. And then finally, I've also shown you uh, what the maximum non-classicality value of the Kirchhoff-Dirac distribution is, and it's 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 upper bounded by this value here. Um, so, so with that, I just want to say many thanks for you guys for, for tuning in and listening to this talk. If you have any questions, please please email me on, on this, this address here. Uh, here is the, the link to, to, to two of the papers we have uh, looking at Kirkwood distribu Dirac distributions. And finally, this here is a, a little schematic of of an optical prototype that we're currently building um, uh, in collaboration, or it's being built at Ephraim Steinberg's group at the University of Toronto, uh, where uh, a bunch of very talented quantum opticians are, are working on using our research for, for quantum negativity and Kirchhoff-Dirac distributions in order to improve metrology. Um, okay, so, so that's it from me. Um, thanks, thanks again. Bye.